All right. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Fischer. I'm a professor of design at Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen. And in this presentation, I will take a look at the connection between feedback and analog computing and at how the connection between these two things matters in dynamic systems modeling. And I want to share an effort to translate this relevance into resources for systems related education. So just a first word about feedback and analog computing. The roots of both go back to the first century BC. What do I mean by feedback? Feedback is the re-entry of a system's output as its input, forming a circularly causal loop such that the system's future conduct is adjusted in response to its past performance, fundamental to systems and cybernetics. Among the first known human-made mechanisms to employ feedback is Heron's self-filling wine bowl, which dispenses a liquid until a certain level is reached, either with a float or by weighing the weight in the bowl, kind of like the flush tank of the toilet stops filling itself after a while today. By computing, I mean the purposeful transformation of inputs into outputs by technical means according to well-defined models or rules. And currently, the earliest human-made mechanism to afford computation is the Antikythera mechanism, which took a rotational input and interprets that as a passage of time to predict the occurrence of various calendar events such as eclipses, Olympiads, and so on. I guess I don't have to explain too much about feedback in this context. This is the flyball governor in the uh, rotary steam engine. This is a classroom demonstration device I have built, which consists basically of a temperature sensitive switch strapped to an incandescent light bulb and that then behaves as a thermostat, creating a very characteristic oscillation around a target temperature. And there are various expressions of feedback, not only with regards to physical measurements, but also with symbolic representations. Here's an example that Heinz von Furster described, a recursive sentence that goes, this sentence has dot, dot, dot letters, and this sort of has an eigenvalue, a correct solution. Actually, in the English language, it has two correct solutions. I think it's shown here 31 and 33, assuming that we take the hyphen as a letter. In different languages, we get different solutions, but this converges on two correct solutions that it can be described as its eigenform or eigenbehavior. Another example Heinz von Furster used is mathematical. When an operation is performed repeatedly on an initial value on a pocket calculator, then in some cases, the solution also converges on a stable number. Here we have the square root of one and also the square root of two, sorry, square root of three, converging on particular values. This is a small interpreter for difference equations in Python code to be run on a digital computer that takes difference equations and shows how these express recognizable forms such as conversions, divergence, oscillation, damping, mutual damping, and also erratic, unpredictable behaviors that are characteristic and recognizable for an onlooking observer and always have an element that changes, but also has elements that are conserved in those systems. Ross Ashby built a machine that has an internal feedback loop such that the inputs fed into the machine through two toggle switches leads to on and off changes in two lamps in an unpredictable pattern. There's no random generator in this device, but it's impossible for a human to analytically determine what the machine does on the next interaction because it has a transcomputable variety of 10 to the power of 126. And I recently had an opportunity to work on this machine with a colleague from the American Society for Cybernetics, Andre Cretu. And this is, a, I think, a really important machine. And it has inspired Heinz von Furster to formulate the idea of the non-trivial machine, a machine that has a hidden internal machine state 
that co-determines its output and therefore becomes analytically indeterminable, i.e. unpredictable. So feedback can give us both stability and predictability, but also unpredictability. And this translates into the social domain as individuals and as groups, we perceive our own articulations. And that also leads to change and it also leads to things being conserved and expressing themselves as stable identities. The upper example on this slide, the factory, is taken and simplified from a book titled Factor 4. And it basically describes a factory that for its industrial purposes needs to take water maybe for cooling, maybe for cleaning something out of a nearby river and then releases it downstream. And in this book, the scenario is described where regulations require the factory to take in its water downstream and releasing it upstream instead of the other way around so that it becomes subject to the consequences of its own action, thereby regulating itself instead of creating a mess for everyone downstream. And there's a similar scenario in the social space of an airplane when you consider how we share leg space and what happens when we recline the seat. There's an aircraft seat design where when I recline the seat, I eat into the leg space of the person behind me who I conveniently don't have to look in the eye as I do so. And I can just assume that they do the same. And then we've got a wave of not very social behavior rippling through the cabin. Instead, there's also a design for the aircraft seat where reclining my seat causes the lower part of the seat that I'm sitting on to slide forward. And now I'm eating into my own leg space. And now I face the consequences of my own action. And I have to decide whether I want to do this at my own expense rather than at the expense of someone else. So this is, these are a couple of examples of how feedback leads to stable identities and responsiveness to the consequences of one's own actions. How does this now relate to analog computing? That's where this mechanism at the bottom comes in. This is called a ball and disk integrator. Sometimes it's called a ball and disk and cylinder integrator. In this case, down here, we see a disk, a ball, and a cylinder. And it performs a mathematical integration. I will explain how that works in a second, but I thought it's important to point out that the integration sign that we have in mathematics to describe what this machine does is actually the logo of the ISSS because of the importance of accumulation over time in dynamic systems modeling. So this is fundamental to what we do, but that origin in analog computing is largely forgotten and I think it should be revived. So how does this mechanism work? It was invented by James Thompson, British scientist and engineer. And imagine the disk at the bottom rotates at a constant rate to mark the passage of time like a clock. And that rotation we call A. And the rotation of the axle in front, axle B, that is our input. And you see how that input moves the ball back and forth along the diameter of the disk, such that the rotation of the disk now turns the ball. And the ball, in turn, turns the cylinder. And the rotation of that cylinder is our output C. Note how the ball may turn in one direction or the other, depending on which side of the disk it touches. Yeah, on the further out it gets, the faster it turns, and the further it gets to the center point, the less it turns, and eventually it starts turning the other way, uh, and therefore it can represent positive and negative values. Now, imagine if our rotation of the disk can be plotted as an independent variable along the horizontal axis, and our input B, tracing a continuous function, can be mapped on the y-axis, then our output C, within a time interval of operation, marks the integral of our input B. It measures the area under the curve in a really elegant way. 
So then James Thompson's brother comes in, the later Lord Kelvin, and he looks at this and he says, well, what happens if we take the output and connect it to the input? So the machine starts driving itself and it feeds on its own output. In this very straightforward example, if the ball starts near the edge of the disc, it would basically pull the ball further and further to the center point of the disc. It would turn slower and slower and slower, and its rate of rotation would approach zero. And that would give us a decay function, which means we now have an analog, a model of a decay function. And plotting that graph, we can maybe look at a radioactive sample yesterday and today and extrapolate and predict its radioactivity in a week. Yeah, so we have done some computation, not through binary representation, but by creating a mechanical model. And the idea here is to do that with a cascade of integrators to solve higher order differential equations. Ultimately, what analog computers do is they model differential equation and we use one integrator for each order of a differential equation. So if we have a second order differential equations, we use two integrators. If we have a system of differential equations, maybe a first order and a second order one, then we need three of those integrators. The solutions of differential equations are graphs rather than numbers, which means we are plotting lines. That's what this is about. And with those lines, there comes a lot of insight into the behavior of systems. You can easily imagine how any pair of cogs on the feedback path can have a gear ratio and act as a multiplier. It's also possible to perform additions in similar ways. And with all of those elements, it now becomes possible to literally represent differential equations in mechanisms. And that's been done for a while. This is the input table and the output table of a machine designed by Veniva Bush at MIT around 1930, where the machine would mark the passage of time by turning its disks and at the same time move those mechanisms across those tables. One table is an input table where an operator had to crank a crank to trace an input curve as time progresses. And then the integrators do their job and solve a function that's been set up in this analog computing setup. There is a huge problem in doing this mechanically. The Thompson brothers actually never built this. They only wrote about it in principle, they described it in theory, but they couldn't build it because there is a very steep drop in torque. There's not a lot of power that comes out of the end of that mechanism. So if you want to drive the second one with the output of the first, it's practically not doable. So Veniva Bush came up with this contraption over there, which is a torque amplifier a very temperamental and finicky thing, which kind of worked. But the problem is that you need an amplifier, a force or a torque amplifier to basically have a daisy chain of integrators driving each other. And that was the state of the art for a while. Here we have the differential analyzer at MIT. There's a bunch of other ones at Cambridge University, Manchester University. This one over here is aboard a warship to calculate artillery trajectories in real time. And we see those disks in all of these devices. Yeah, we've literally got two of these disks over here. Veniva Bush's differential analyzer had six of those disks. And interestingly enough, from a cybernetic history perspective, Norbert Wiener, who wrote the book titled Cybernetics that gave the field its name, went to join Tsinghua University in China as a guest researcher in 1936. And his main project that he wanted to get done there was to translate Veniva Bush's mechanical differential analyzer into an electronic system. And he failed because the electronics of the time were not ready. This is a passage where he describes that in his autobiography. He doesn't go into great detail, but it's quite clear that he runs into the electronic 
equivalent of the mechanical torque loss. And that was only overcome with the invention of the operational amplifier by George Philbrick between the 1940s and 1950s, commercialized in 1953. And that is a device that allows integration in a particular configuration, but with very high gain and a high power output so that there is no degradation when you put multiple ones of them in a sequence. And operational amplifiers, of course, the original one, as you see, was built around two vacuum tubes. And since then, there were various other packages and designs based on semiconductors. And nowadays, they are tiny and we got multiple ones in very miniature packages. So analog computing was mainstream between the 1950s and 1970s. And analog computing took the shape basically of patch cable wiring of analog computing elements, such as electronic integrators, inverters, summers, multipliers, and so forth. And eventually this was displaced by digital computing for a variety of reasons. One major reason was scalability and also generality. Uh, digital computing is applicable across a broader range of problems. Yeah, we cannot use analog computing to check our email. Yeah, they solve differential equations. Analog computers also make it very difficult to scale up to solve larger problems. On a digital computer, larger problems can be solved with more code and larger memory, whereas analog computing ends up with more and more spaghetti plates like these, and that doesn't scale very well. But Analog computing is now making a comeback, not to replace digital, but to form an analog digital hybrid future with analog coprocessors taking load off digital CPUs. Wherever we have to solve differential equations, analog computers also do a little bit more than solve differential equations, but the mainstream application is solving differential equations, which is very important in scientific computing, uh, simulation, modeling, gaming, and so forth. Yeah, physics simulation relates to everything. Exactly. And a lot of gaming is actually physics simulation. So there are some strengths of analog computing that now make analog computers look really attractive. Number one, from a computing perspective, is it works with much less energy. Yeah, the thing that accumulates and integrates is literally a tiny capacitor that charges and discharges. And the energy consumption of an analog computer today is at one thousandth of a digital computer. So we're looking at a very significant reduction of energy consumption, heat loss, CO2 footprint, and so forth. Also, the shrinking scale of semiconductors is now hitting the limits of Moore's law. You may have noticed that for about 15 years, the clock cycle frequencies of our computers, they are kind of stuck at two or three gigahertz and it doesn't really get faster because it's really hard to get chips smaller to a point where in terms of heat management and uh, reliability, the technology still makes sense. So if we want to keep improving computational performance, then it makes sense to look at increased parallelism and analog coprocessing to basically have the two paradigms, analog and digital, work hand in hand, each according to its strengths. There are other reasons why analog is coming back from a cybersecurity perspective. It can shrink present attack surface by replacing some digital industrial control systems or providing fallback options for when they get compromised. And also from an educational perspective, and that's what I want to talk about, analog computers offer resources for systems thinking and modeling at an age of global crisis. I argue that our educational systems are currently not doing a good job at conveying the competency and the skills and the sensitivity that we need to appreciate how systems behave. And analog computers are actually a really good way of doing that. So a number of systems have been developed over the years to do that. There is actually an analog educational computer that was designed in the 1980s 
just as digital computing surged, so it was kind of overshadowed. Later, analog computers have been developed here and there in higher education and research settings, usually as one-off prototypes. And there are currently one or two mass-produced analog training kits that we see in the middle over here. But these are geared towards highly technical engineering contexts with very little recognition of broader conceptual potentials of analog computing. Usually, they are about filter designs and oscillators and things like that, looking at very narrow engineering problems, ignoring the broader applicability to problems in the social environmental domain and so forth. On the right-hand side, there are two screenshots of a simulation game by Frederick Fester named EcoPolicy. In this game, the player interacts with a model society based on eight key indicators that are related under the hood via a set of differential equations. And the player has to try to maintain social stability in that environment, which is really difficult. But it allows users to experience this one dynamic systems model with one literal interpretation. And the math is hidden. And I think it would be more interesting to allow users to actually build their own dynamic systems model and to interpret and apply them freely. So to this end, I had the opportunity to work with a German technology startup company named Anabrid and to design this device named the Analog Thing, or for short, that. This is a classic analog computer, but for the 21st century, it's been described as a kind of Raspberry Pi, but without zeros and ones. What the machine ultimately does is it solves differential equations. The device is designed for the mutually contradicting objectives of quality and affordability. As you see, the device is executed as a sandwich of two printed circuit boards. Circuit boards are these boards that usually hold and connect the electronic components inside house devices. But in this case, the top circuit board itself doubles up as the user interface. Another consideration here is comparable to the way that home computers in the 1980s could either be connected to an expensive monitor if the user could afford it, and if users could not afford an expensive monitor, then the designers of those machines back then assumed that every household has a TV, so the computer could just be hooked up to a TV. And in a very similar sense, the analog thing is ideally connected to a high-quality bench oscilloscope, but if none is available, it can be plugged into the sound card of any computer, and then the sound card can sample that signal. As you see over there, that's a no, that's actually a digital oscilloscope, but here I, ha I have a sound card, and I'm going to demonstrate the device in a second. So the machine comes in a box with a pack of patch cables that look like this. They come in different colors. There is a guidebook that I am developing and sort of continuously growing, and there is a couple of accessories. The box doesn't include the USB power supply because we just decided that everyone's got a bunch of those lying around anyways. And yeah, as you see, the patch panel is divided into sections with different computing elements. And most importantly, along the top over here, we've got five integrators and a bunch of other things like inverters, summers, and so forth. There are eight coefficient potentiometers that can be used to set values. And yeah, this is basically all you need to model a broad variety of dynamic systems. If you run out of computing elements because you're exhausting the number of elements that are available on the device, you can use a second one and connect them in what we call a master minion mode. And you can create daisy chains of an arbitrary number of those machines to create huge models, which I guess should be great fun in a classroom. But I haven't really seen that happen yet because the machine has only been out for a couple of months. So this is the uh, handbook that I'm working on. I've got a couple of copies here of an uh, earlier edition. Just to give you a quick feel of what's in there, it's got some contextualization. It explains what I just explained to you on and how to use the interface. It's got a whole bunch of different ways to connect it to computers and to oscilloscopes, different computing elements. And here is basically the radioactive decay 
model that I explained earlier, built around this is the symbol of an integrator. There's a potentiometer that sets an initial value. That's basically how much to the right sits the ball on the disk. How radioactive is our sample at the moment when we start the analog computing program? And then we've got an inverter to deal with a particularity of the integrator, which happens to flip the, the sign of its solution. That's something that analog computers do in general. Some of the computing element flip the sign, which in many cases actually makes sense. In this case, it doesn't. And when it doesn't, we use an inverter to turn it back and we get to plot our decay function. Here is a mass spring damper system. I'm going to demonstrate that in a second. Then there is a lunar landing game where the task is to use a throttle, like one of the potentiometers acts as a, an engine throttle. We're approaching the lunar surface from an orbital velocity and we have to land the lunar lander at a safe speed. But decelerate on the way down with a very limited amount of fuel, which is quite challenging. A model uh, of neuronal bursting, some other mathematical functions. This is uh, the Euler spiral. Here is a predator-prey model. I'm going to demonstrate that in a moment as well. Uh, chaotic attractors. This is a bouncing ball on the left side. On the right-hand side, this is a polynomial generator, which is basically a set up to draw arbitrary functions. And that is very helpful when, for example, some empirically acquired data needs to be fed into a computer. Or if there's a particular non-linear relationship that needs to enter and needs to be modeled, then a part of the machine or a secondary machine can be set aside to draw arbitrary functions. And I will explain how that works in a second as well. Yeah, some helper functions, some frequently asked questions. So that's the, the general idea. So one example is the um, mass spring damper system, as we see on a suspension fork of a mountain bike, the telescopic thing that holds the front wheel which absorbs impacts caused by rough terrain and improves riding comfort. But very importantly, it also maximizes the time during which the front wheel actually has ground contact. Now, most people think of a suspension as something that serves comfort, but you actually want to maximize the time of wheel contact to the ground because every moment your wheel is airborne, braking and steering doesn't work. So it's very important in terms of safety. The rider and the suspension form a physical arrangement called a mass spring damper system. There's a spring in one leg of the fork, there's a damper in the other, and the body weight and the weight of the bicycle are basically a mass suspended on the spring and the damper. And the damper is actually quite important. When I started mountain biking, I didn't think about that. But if you don't have a damper, then your your suspension fork is basically a pogo stick. And again, very it's, uh, it, it's not safe to have no damper. You actually want to return back to the neutral position without any bouncing around with something called critical damping. And that is something that can be modeled with the analog thing where if you have some lab acquired coefficients for the uh, damping constant or the damping coefficients and your spring coefficient, you can model that on the system and then do a whole bunch of exploration and modeling without actually making prototypes. So without going into too much detail, the relationship in this system can be derived from axiomatic basic laws. We know how the force of the spring corresponds to its displacement. The force of the damper corresponds to the speed. Mass is proportional to acceleration. And when you put all of that together, you end up with this term down here, which basically says that you've got a second order ordinary differential equation that relates the damper and the spring in relation to y, which is the displacement, over the mass of the rider, essentially. And now there is a technique that again goes back to Lord Kelvin, where he says, if you have a differential equation like this, 
the equal sign and the fact that it signifies that the two sides of the equal sign have the same value, that allows us to model the left-hand side of that expression and to simply feed its output back to its input. And this is how we translate the mathematical representation of our model into a circuit that basically has one integrator to derive the acceleration, one that derives the position, the displacement. And then we've got two coefficients that can be dialed in with a potentiometer for the spring coefficient and the damper coefficient. And then we use another potentiometer to dial in the reciprocal value of the rider's mass, which in this case, it says 0.5. You can basically set that to different masses, different spring constant, different damper constants. And then this is what it looks like. And I want to see if I can quickly demonstrate that. So here's a oscilloscope software and now I can sort of change my body weight for example and spring constant and I can look at how that system changes. For this kind of momentary action the device has what is called a repeat mode where it goes back to the initial value, runs for a second, goes back to the initial value and then it generates ideally a flicker-free image. Okay, so let's look at another example where we don't go into that repeat mode. Maybe you're aware of this is a classic example of a pattern that was identified in the sales records of a Canadian fur trading company where the two species that were hunted for their fur in Canada, the horseshoe hare and lynx, that they are in an interesting relationship. The overall quantity, the overall size of the populations has changed over the years. This is a trading record of multiple decades. Yeah, each of these down here is a decade. The changing quantities may as well um, reflect changing hunting activity, but it's kind of interesting that they go up and down together with a slight phase shift between them. And that was described mathematically by Alfred Lotka and Vito Volterra in 1925 and 1926 independently, which is basically this system of two first order ordinary differential equations where you see that the value of one shows up in the other. Yeah, we've got the, this one computes L for the population of lynx and the L has an effect on the death rate of the hair and the hair shows up promoting the birth rate of the lynx down here and together they form a dynamic system that plays out over time in a way that in system dynamics we uh, represent somewhat like this. But again, it can be translated into a circuit diagram to program the analog computer. Again, with two integrators, one for each of the first order ordinary differential equations. So these are our two species over time. And now I can mess around with birth rates and predation rates. And yeah, now you see I'm just playing around with one of the variables and then I've wiped out two species. The fact that these are two species is just a minimal reductive case. We can set up an ecosystem with 20 species and you will see that messing around with one species can wipe out the ecosystem, which I think is a really interesting aha moment in an educational setting. So where is this going? I want to extend the handbook. The next thing I want to do is a simple dive computer, moving from ordinary differential equations to um, partial differential equations. The accumulation of inert gas in body tissue depends not only on time of a dive, but also on depth. So I want to use uh, the polynomial generator to model a bathtub curve, to model the descent, bottom time, ascent. And then the analog computer will calculate the duration of the decompression stop the diver has to take. Another thing is using multiple VATs to recreate Jay Forrester's system dynamics world model to 
yeah, basically bring that back into educational discourse, which I think is rather important. Um, there is no conclusion, just two observations that I think are really important. There is a general lack of systems thinking in formal education. And there is a disconnect between the conceptual thinking skills and the formal thinking skills in systems. And that experience needs to be promoted. And that's what this is trying to do. Thank you very much.